Hi students, we're gonna take some notes here about double replacement reactions. Remember, because these are video notes, you can always pause the video if you need it, take some time to actually write things down. So pull out a piece of paper or pull out your science notebook. Let's get started. Let's start with the essential question. Write this at the top of your page, preferably emphasize it with a colored pen. How do you predict the products of a double replacement reaction? This question relates to the learning targets you're gonna be assessed on, and we're gonna to try to answer this at a deep level at the end of the video. So remember, we talked about many types of chemical reactions. You should be able to recognize many of these reactions if they're given to you, but slowly we're trying to learn how to write them. In fact, the first two, composition and decomposition, and composition and decomposition, you should be able to predict the products of these reactions if given the reactants. Single replacement, some of you know how to do this, some of you don't. We're gonna kind of skip that one for now, and we're gonna go straight into double replacement reaction. If we gave you the reactants, you should be able to determine that that's a double replacement reaction and find the products. In a later date, we'll talk about combustion, but let's go ahead and talk about double replacement reactions. What is it? Here's an example of a double replacement reaction. I love the picture. You might want to write this down. Here's the definition. It's, it's a little complicated, but ions in each substance exchange compound, sorry, ions in each compound will exchange places in an aqueous solution to form two new compounds. So what does that even mean? Well, I like to think of it kind of like a dance. Here we have two compounds, AB and CD, and they're kind of dancing together. And what they're going to do is they're going to decide to switch their partners. Now, how do they decide to do that? Well, we always pair like charges. We always pair cations or positively charged things with anions, negatively charged things. So AB is a positive negative set. Maybe it's an element and another element that are positive and negative, a metal and a non-metal, or maybe it's a metal and a polyatomic ion. C and D are the same. We have a positive and a negative. Notice we always put positive first and negative second. Well, these guys are going to exchange partners. So who's their new partner going to be? Well, A is going to find D because A is positive and D is negative. So it's going to find a new partner. And C is going to find B. If C is positive, B is negative. This is basically how a double replacement reaction works. Now, there are two types of double replacement reactions you're going to need to know. We're going to focus mainly on the first one in these slides. In a later module, you'll talk about the second one. So the first one is called the precipitation reaction. If we have a double replacement reaction and it forms a precipitate, or in other words, if it forms a solid, and we know it would using solubility rules, then we call that a precipitation reaction. And I'll show you that in detail in these slides. The second one is an acid-based neutralization reaction. If a double replacement forms water, then that is an acid-based neutralization reaction. And I'll give you an example of that, but we're gonna focus on that at a later module. So what do we see in real life? This is what you might see at the macro or life scale. Here we have two substances. Now these substances are solid substances and they, they don't really react well in this form. This is what they look like at the molecular level. Do you notice the partners? We have a purple and a red partner, a positive and a negatively charged thing. There's just lots of them here. There's many quantities or many moles of it. Now the state symbol is an S meaning solid. Over here we have blue and orange. And again, many quantities of them, but the state symbol is solid. Now these substances we're going to take and we're going to dissolve them in water so we can get them to react easier. So we're going to chuck them in beakers full of water and they're going to dissolve. What does that look like at the micro scale or at the atomic level? Well, this is what happens. Those particles break apart and they're free flowing in water, positive charge and negative charge. And we would call this an aqueous solution. In fact, we might even call it an electrolyte because there's positive and negative charge. So we're going to take these two beakers with these two salts. They look pretty unspectacular, just clear liquids because they're dissolved. We're going to mix them together and they're going to go through a reaction. And this is what we're going to get as a product. This is what really what's really cool. And this is this is a reaction. You notice that it formed this kind of solid, chunky yellow stuff. Well, it changed color. It formed a precipitate. Um, that is, those are some signs of chemical change. So this is a double replacement precipitation reaction. So at the molecular level, these substances exchange partners. And in some cases, some of those partners, namely the blue meeting with the purple, form a precipitate. And so we would call that a solid. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they still stay aqueous and they don't really interact with each other. They're just free floating. That is a soluble or aqueous solution. But this is a precipitation reaction. That yellow stuff is a precipitate. So how do we know whether it forms a precipitate or not? Well, we use solubility rules. Now, these are found on the back of your periodic table. If you don't have your periodic table, you might want to consider printing one. You should be one posted in the resources on Schoology. But go ahead and pull your periodic table out and look at the back side, and you'll see these rules. How do they work? Well, we start on the left side. These are the if-then statements. For example, if you see these particles in a compound, then this compound should be aqueous. 
but there's always exceptions. So we're going to look at the exceptions. Unless if these things are attached to these things, then it flips it and becomes insoluble. By the way, notice I said insoluble, but the symbol is S. S does not mean soluble. It means insoluble. In fact, S means solid. Insoluble means precipitate. It's forming a solid. So it's likewise, if you see these compounds, if you see these substances in a compound, it's an S or insoluble. Unless they're attached to these, then it's AQ or soluble. Now, one thing to note, many of you might not have this on your periodic table. It says alkali metal cations. Remember, the alkali metals are the first column on the periodic table. That's lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. You might consider writing those in there instead of the alkali metal cations if they're not already done for you. So let's apply these to some of these product products over here. Let's say we did a reaction and we formed potassium nitrate. Well, here's nitrate. It should be soluble. And in fact, it is because there's no exception. It doesn't matter that it's attached to potassium. So we're going to write AQ as the symbol. So this is a soluble product. How about silver chloride? Well, chlorine is also up here. It's also soluble. But chlorine in this case is attached to silver and silver is an exception. So it's going to flip it over to insoluble. Maybe consider pausing the video and see if you can figure out the next two. I'm going to go ahead and show you those, but pause the video if you want to do so beforehand and then check your work. All right, the next two, calcium sulfide. So here's sulfur. It's insoluble, but calcium is an exception, so it's aqueous. And then the last one is calcium carbonate. Carbonate is insoluble, and calcium is not one of the exceptions. So this is a product that is a precipitate. Let's actually apply this to a double replacement reaction. So this is a teacher example reaction. You might just consider putting your pencil down and just watching and trying to participate. I'll give you a student-led example in the next slide that you can do on your page. But let's see how this one works. All right, so here are two reactants that are given to you, lead to nitrate and potassium iodide. Before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about their charges. Lead here is a positive 2. Now, the periodic table won't be able to tell me that, but I know it because it's attached to nitrate. Nitrate on the periodic table says it's a minus 1, and there are 2 nitrates, so there's not that means a minus 2. So because there's only 1 lead, it has to be a positive 2 charge. Now, potassium and iodine, potassium on the periodic table is a positive 1. It's in the first column, and iodine is a minus 1. It's on the last column. So there's only one of each of those. So if you understand double replacement reactions, you know that these partnerships are going to switch, but positive is always going to go with negative. So lead is going to go with iodine. Now, some of you have noticed that, hey, why is there a two over here? Well, again, don't forget, lead is a positive two charge, just like it was over in the reactant side, and iodine is still a minus one charge. So there has to be two iodines. So there's a discrepancy between both sides and the quantities at this moment, but we'll fix that in a minute. All right, you might have predicted that potassium now is going to go with nitrate. So potassium, again, is still a plus one charge, and nitrate is still a minus one charge. So we only have one potassium and one nitrate. And so that's how that works out. So we're done writing and double replacing these things, but we're not done with this reaction because, as we noticed before, there's a discrepancy in the balancing. There's one iodine here, two here. There's two nitrates here, but only one nitrate over here. So we need to add coefficients in front of certain compounds in order to get them to balance. Now, if you don't know how to write reactions like this to cancel charge or how to balance it using coefficients, I really recommend you go check out some resources on Schoology or watch some YouTube videos on how to write and balance reactions because that's a really important skill to know now. All right, let's finish talking about the solubility of the products. The reactants are always aqueous, kind of like we saw before. We just took those chunks of salt and we dissolved them in water. But the products may or may not be aqueous, so we need to use solubility rules to figure that out. So I'm going to pull up my table. I'm going to look at lead to iodide. Now, iodine is right here. It says that it is soluble, so this should be AQ, but look, it's attached to lead, so it's actually flipped over and it is insoluble. So this is our precipitate. This is what makes this double replacement reaction a precipitation reaction. If we were to mix these two things, we would see some type of a snotty, chunky solid in there. Maybe it might even change color to something yellow or white or something like that. All right, how about the potassium nitrate? Well, nitrate is soluble, it's aqueous, and there's no exceptions. It's always going to be that way. So here we are, and we finish writing this reaction, a great example that you might see in a practice. In fact, here's a practice for you. I would recommend right now pausing this video and seeing if you can solve this on your own on your page. Did you pause the video? Please do so.
All right, I'm going to show you how this works. So if you haven't paused the video and done it, do that first. So here we have iron two sulfide and we have sodium hydroxide. So these are going to form these products. Again, these are just charges canceling out. Iron is a positive two. Hydroxide is a minus one. Sodium is a positive one. Sulfur is a minus two. Those are charges as found on your periodic table. Okay, well, what about balancing? Well, we need to put a two in front of sodium hydroxide in the front in order to make sure that both sides are balanced. All right, we're off to a great start. We've written a reaction and we balanced it. Let's determine the solubility rules. All right, first we have iron to hydroxide. So hydroxide is right here, it's insoluble. And iron is not an exception. So we're gonna write S, this is our precipitate. All right, how about sodium sulfide? Well, sulfur's down here, it's also insoluble, but don't forget those alkali metal cations, those alkali metals, sodium is an alkali metal, so it actually flipped it to become AQ. All right, here's the second type of precipitation reaction. I'm not going to go over this one, but you might want to write it down as an example. We'll talk about acid-base uh, neutralization reactions at a later date, but it works on the same principle, positive charges canceling out negative charges. Now, in this case, we form water, which is a liquid. By the way, acids are found on your periodic table as well. They're on the back side. These are pretty much the acids that we're going to use for the most part in this in, in later units. But again, we'll get to that later. All right, we've just finished the notes. You should take a moment now to review and highlight your notes. Go back and make sure you uh, summarize things and highlight key terms. Ponder and ask questions. Maybe you have some questions that you can think about. If you do have questions, you should consider maybe writing those questions in the discussions on Schoology so your teacher can do uh, respond to them or other students can respond to them. Or even better, attend a live teacher session and ask your questions and get those questions answered. Finally, do you remember that essential question we started off? Well, by now you should be able to answer it with some detail and some examples. So you might want to do that on your page. You should, at the very bottom, write a summary to your essential question. Answer that question with some detail. All right. Good luck, guys.